Welcome back to the channel. We're here once again with my Cub Cadet 149, which I just call the 14. I've done a whole bunch of work on this thing in the past. Probably do a whole bunch of work on it in the future too. There's a playlist for that, linked right up here, as well as down in the description, where you can go get caught up on all the happenings. One such happening was I just had to split the tractor to reseal a transmission leak. As such, the fenders and stuff are already off of it. At the end of this video, I'll show you how to put them back on, because, you know, the procedure is the same both ways. What we're here to do today is replace the main power harness for this thing, which runs right along the frame, and then probably up to the starter relay, and then over to the starter, because mine is not in very good shape. Just kind of illustrate what I mean. A few years back, this positive lead just straight up fell off the thing. When that happened, it was not with me. It was in storage at my dad's place. We did not even have a torch or a crimper big enough for this gauge of wire. So I think my dad more or less just like beat on it until he got it to crimp back down. Got on it with channel locks or something. But you can see the wire inside there is just super corroded. This is all green and gross and nasty and everything. There is not enough slack in this wire to like cut it back further and try and find good wire or anything like that. And I imagine as we follow this all the way up the tractor, we'll find little nicks and cuts and stuff like that. And it is, of course, also 50 years old. So I'm sure the insulation won't last forever. Also, this thing has always been what we call cold-blooded. Anytime it's, we'll say, 50 degrees or less, you're going to be lucky if the thing gets started at all. And it's not because the motor's bad or the tune on the carb's bad or anything. It just seems to crank really hard. This motor calls for SA30. That's what it's always got. Uh, I have experience with three other Cubs. That's what they get. They all start up just fine. This one never has. So since we're going to be in here replacing anyway, many years ago I decided let's put some four gauge in it. I think this is six gauge. That way we'll get a decent upgrade out of it. Well, when I finally got my wire out and started comparing it, it's like, you know, that really doesn't seem like much of an upgrade to me. And since it was like five years ago when I bought this wire, maybe even longer, I have since misplaced the black that I also bought. So if I'm going shopping anyhow, why not some two gauge? And just really have at it. You can see the two gauge next to the six is a significant increase. And I'm pretty sure it's going to fit in the clips and everything. So I think that's what we're going to do. Uh, I will warn you, spring of 2022 is not the time you want to buy oxygen free fully tinned Coast Guard rated marine grade wire. Uh, 20 feet of wire and a few ring connectors and stuff was $115. So good times to be had. But we've got it now. That's what we're doing. We're putting some two gauge on in place of some six and it all crank like son of a gun after that. And if it won't, then well, it won't. I should also say too, I've also like in bad weather and everything, it didn't matter if I put like a, a jumper pack on the battery, uh, put jumper cables and another battery on it or anything else. It always just cranked that, that poorly. The wire upgrade, I think, is going to be a good thing for it all together. So I'm thinking the next thing that needs done is probably going to have to pull the fuel tank tower assembly, which is really not a big deal. And to do that, we just have six screws to remove. That one, those two, and on the other side, that one and those two, and then the fuel line. I usually take the fuel line off the carburetor, I think, just because it's the easiest one to get to. Or maybe the fuel filter, I don't know. Yours probably doesn't have a fuel filter. Feel free to add one. I'm gonna get that done. We'll cut you right up. Oh, and I know there's supposed to be a filler plate in here that I know my tractor doesn't have. You will probably need to deal with that at some point. So as I suspected, there is a starter solenoid right there. I've taken a few minutes to just kind of look around. I've noticed they made a few interesting design decisions when they built this thing that are gonna be fun to deal with now. And unlike most of the interesting things done to this tractor, I'm pretty sure this one came from the factory this way because it's done well, it's just done weird. This wire right here is the one coming from the battery, I'm pretty sure. This wire right here, I'm pretty sure energizes the headlights. So it looks like it runs right to the headlight switch. This wire is crimped in with the terminal for this wire, which I'm pretty sure is the one that run, runs to the starter. And that goes up to the charge gauge, which makes sense. What doesn't make sense is why it wouldn't be on a ring terminal like the headlights here are and why they went through the trouble of doing all that. So I am probably going to do exactly that and just put it on the ring terminal and have less of a pain in my butt. Other interesting things, the clamping for all the wires is right under the hydraulic lift cylinder. So those are the wires going forward and those are the wires going backward. My linkage here will look different than yours because I've eliminated the goofy cub cadet stuff and just gone right to the rock shaft. But anyway, there's another clipping point right behind here. So I may end up mechanically disconnecting the cylinder and just setting it back to the side to try and get some better access here. May not need to though. I think that one will bend out from the bottom and this cable will drop out and the new one should drop in. Likewise, I'm hoping that I can more or less just tie on the new wire to the old wire on the other end and just pull it up through from the generator. Just because it is the less funky wire, I think I'm going to start with this guy, meaning I don't have to deal with this right away. 
and just see what's going on there. We'll get that guy busted off and I'll start tracing it back through the frame and see where we go. All right then, so as usual, everything I thought I knew was wrong. This forward wire that was right there is the one that goes up to the generator. The good news is that clip right there, I was able to open up just with a screwdriver from the other side. Uh, the bad news is that wire is so old and inflexible that I'm probably gonna have to cut it up to get it out of there anyway. I'm not gonna be able to just fish a new wire behind the old one, which meh, not the end of the world. Of course, there's where it connects onto the generator, no big deal. Comes down through this clip and I think it's big enough I can wiggle our new guy through it. And our new guy, of course, is, you know, flexible, so it's gonna route more easily. But while I was here, this guy and this guy were taped together like so. And I noticed some tape on up higher on the wire and it's actually such funky tape to me, it doesn't even look like electrical tape. It looks almost like ancient hockey tape, but it's it's so old looking. I just assumed it was always part of the tractor somehow and never looked at it more deeply. Well, I cut it off and this is what I found underneath. That is a splice to the original harness that goes over to the points. And that repair over there is one I made like 10 years ago that's shrink tubed and soldered and everything. Uh, that has been twisted together with nothing holding it there for the last as far as I know, 30 years. Uh, you can see this cable starting to burn right there. And it's also just, it's broken many strands because there's a stress riser right there. And that is about to just break right off. Those are the only remaining strands of wire that we're doing anything. So what, like six or eight individual strands of copper. So I've got some nice seven gauge we'll end up tying into this guy with and we'll get plenty of power over to our coil and everything will be fine, but good grief. I mean, stuff like this is why I really ought to just replace the whole harness. I really don't want to deal with that right now. Back to our trouble with this guy. I think we're gonna end up okay. So nothing left now but to do it. If you've never made any kind of battery cables before or heavy gauge cables, there are just a couple specialized tools to make your life a little easier. First of all, our actual cable cutters, that's what they're for. It's for cutting giant wire. Make your life a lot easier than trying to use tin snips or harsh language or whatever else you want. The other thing is cable stripper. The idea is this guy has a blade on the inside. You just put your wire in there you turn them around and then when you hit that lever it spins the blade and cuts a slit so then you can just peel the insulation off of course you can do this with a razor blade or something it's just a nightmare to do it that way it sucks neither of these were very expensive that's whatever they had at lowe's the day i went to buy it and this is from parts express so they're both just cheap like that's a greenly and this is a whatever the next thing we need to look at is just how much insulation we're going to cut off once we get down into this radius right here you know the wire won't have anywhere to go so we want to be back from that a little bit so to my eye that is about a half inch of insulation i'm going to want to cut off also this terminal may look like it's you know cheap galvanized or whatever to you this is a solid copper lug that is tinned it's also marine grade, just like the wire is. So this is tin copper, this is tin copper, so it won't corrode and turn green. So this is still like, in fact, this is like the best stuff, not just the good stuff. One thing about this tool is it is a little difficult to get super thin cuts. Like I only want half inch. Give her a spin on around. Well, it just cut a spiral, see? Sometimes when that happens, the blade isn't cutting deep enough and you can adjust that down here. My mistake, that adjusts the tension on this guy. You actually turn the nut to adjust the knife. Let's try that again. This time I'm just gonna turn the wire and see if I can try and keep it from follow, tracing its own line. Nah, it's wanting to do it. Dang it, let's try the other side. I cut this length of wire plenty long. I think it's also spiraling. On the slit it just the same. I think I'm being too gun shy in my depth. I'm just gonna trim this end. And at this point I could just finish this up with a razor blade, but I wanna get the tool set up right. So we got more cables to make. I will give it just a whole lot more spring pressure. And I increase the knife, knife depth a fair bit more. Let me make sure it's not excessive. All right, I think I'm gonna leave it there and try it again. And if this doesn't work, then we will razor blade. I'm doing this one a little closer to my eyeballs so I can keep a better look at what's going on. Yeah, it's kind of spiraling again, but I think we got it. So turn the lever, pull. Yeah. If anything, I still don't think the knife, I still don't think the knife was quite deep enough. Looks like I took a pretty cowardly cut there. Looks like I could probably take about half of that again. I'm not sure if I'll be able to get a cut quite that thin, but I'll try. Yeah, it's wanting to spiral around. I can't blame it this time. Because that's such a thin cut it's trying to take. You know, just from there to there. 
So we'll do this the old fashioned way. The old razor blade. I'm gonna start in a different spot. Yeah, I didn't get even close to cutting all the way through the insulation. Now you see why I like the actual tool when it works. Now I'm reasonably sure I stripped too much, but we'll see. Actually, no, that is just about perfect. Now I do not have a big lug crimper, so I'm gonna solder these on and do that with the torch. And I bought little pellets of solder that go down in here. They're kind of like a pre-measured proper amount, whatever, just so I wouldn't have to burn up the other solder I have. I also bought some flux, which is, I've never really used before for making cables, but we'll see how it goes. Alrighty, so here's a little flux pellet, sorry, solder pellet. Put him down in there, our flux. Just this stuff. This all came from eBay, by the way. I'll do my best to link it for you if I can. But I think we just want a, a couple drops of it. Try and get it straightened out as well as I can too. Okay, that's a lot of flux, I think. I'm gonna light off my map gas torch. Just gonna watch until the solder's melted. Just saw it melt. And there we go. That's all there is to it. Let it sit there and cool for a second. Yep, I couldn't pull that out if I wanted to. It's only been a few moments. Super deal. Got a little ambitious and burnt just a little bit of the insulation, but that's why we have shrink tube. Speaking of, it'll be something like that. I'm just gonna loosely put it back in the vise just to hang on to it so I don't have to do it myself. Got our heat gun. And this was the size recommended by the seller. Seems a little big to me, but we'll find out. Yeah, I'm melting that. Well, maybe not. I think that's it. I certainly wouldn't want it to shrink any less. One cable end. So now our next move is to get that guy routed in where this guy came from. He kind of goes around the throttle cable right there under the cylinder, down into that clip I pried open. And then there's another clip I hope to be able to just sneak it through and then on up to the generator. So I don't think much to it, but to do it at this point. So it turns out that's a little easier said than done. You can see what I've got going on here is just a little bit different than what you saw a minute ago. I moved the throttle cable to the opposite side of the pneumatic cylinder. I'm not sure that which way it's really supposed to go, but I did notice that down here on the engine, you know, some period of time ago, I must have put this split loom on it, but it's wearing through the engine tin. So it was way too tight down here anyway. So I'm going to guess the way it was wasn't right regardless. But anyway, it is now just chilling in here out of the way. I will probably, before I get done, just zip tie it to this hydraulic hose so it doesn't wear through or cause any trouble. And the next issue I'm running into is to get the wire from the rear run into that other clip. Like I'm not, I'm not truly sure if they're gonna to wanna to run up next to each other the way the original ones were. And in fact, I'm pretty sure they're not going to. So I'm, I'm now running the back in before I continue on any further with the front. And this is how we're looking at the starter generator. And this cable I'm now willing to admit is too big. I'm not ready to throw the towel in just yet with putting it on the tractor, but I am going to say if I had to do this over again, I wouldn't go with two gauge, that four gauge would have been plenty. And in fact, it would have been about perfect. This is about the tightest bend I can make and it's kind of rubbing on the generator down here. So when I get done, I'll probably put some split loom over that as well. I also had to bend this ring terminal up so it wouldn't hit the generator case. I think there you can see that where it's boop, so it wouldn't wear through and short out because that would be bad. And this is the only clip on the whole tractor where I have no access to open it up at all to help me out. So to get that in there, I just had to spray this all down with Windex and just keep shoving it and shoving it and pulling it and pulling it and finally it came through. I uh, ended up having to do that a couple times because I got the factory wiring harness in the wrong order. I had it up on top and then that screws up everything. Make sure that this guy goes under that guy. As this was in the beginning, I probably will tape or zip tie that again. Um, probably also put some split loom on it. It seems pretty freaking tight all together here. My guess is that this has been cut on and in fact that's shrink tubes so I know that was me. 
So this has been cut on and patched several times. That's why I should have replaced the whole harness, but we ain't got time for that right now. Speaking of, this is the original cable end off of the cable we were just messing with a minute ago that went up to the starter solenoid, which speaking of, now that I'm way too into it to stop now, it did occur to me that this thing's cold starting problems might be the $15, 20 minute job starter solenoid uh, being carboned up or arced up on the contacts and just not making a good connection. But we're in it to win it regardless as far as the wiring. But while I was there, this is the end that was up there. And this is the end that had the wire for the ammeter crimped into it. You can see it right there. And it turns out that that's just also not bolted on the ammeter. So I'm just gonna run a whole new lead. I was just gonna take this original wire here and strip it back as you see it and just crimp a ring terminal onto it. But you can see that wire is actually pretty corroded. Um, in real life, you can see that it's pretty green, but here I think you can see it's at least tarnished over. So I trimmed that nub off and I tried again and found pretty much the same thing. So I trimmed like another inch and a half off and tried again. And you can see it's still the same thing. It's still tarnished over and just kind of looks crappy. So this was, I'm sure, good quality copper wire 50 years ago when this tractor was built. But time just ravages this kind of stuff. Meanwhile, it's a piece of brand new 10 gauge right next to it that I'm going to use to replace this wire, which I think is probably more like 12 gauge. You can see the difference pretty starkly there, so we should be good. And I'm not going to bother to crimp it into the terminal. I will just put my own ring terminal on it and put it on. I don't think it's going to hurt anything. So now I'm going to just continue trying to feed the two gauge up, and I'll probably have to pick the hydraulic cylinder up to get a little more access to the clip that's in there and just keep trying to feed it in. And meanwhile, pulling the original cable out, and I, it is so stiff that I'm having to cut it up to get it out. And here's also a pretty good chance to illustrate where we were and where we're going and why this has uh, not been that easy to accomplish. Again, if I had to start over, I would have stuck with the four gauge, but we're here now. And if nothing else, I can always uh, put the four gauge in it. The four gauge would just basically drop right in. It'll be a, I don't know, maybe an hour of work to pull this out and put four gauge in if it came to it, but I'm not ready to give up just yet. Oh, not quite so fast. I decided I was just gonna take a, a quick minute and make up the wire we need to run up to the ammeter just so it'd be done. And I would just have that checked off my list. And then I discovered I don't have any of the actual proper size materials to do it. So we're gonna take a minute and talk about doing the wrong thing the right way. What I have here is the most suitable ring terminal I had. And you might be able to guess that it was too small. So I cut it right there and just opened it up a little bit. And now it fits on the stud on the starter solenoid. But just something to keep in mind if you're going to do something like this is try to plan ahead a little bit and cut it open on the side at which it's going to want to close as you tighten things down. So when I put this over the stud, I'll put it on just the way you see it and then put the nut on top of it like that. So as it goes on, it'll want to draw in tighter instead of open up and fall off. Also, I soldered that on after I crimped it because again, this isn't the right size. So this has been crimped and soldered. It's going to be a fine connection. It probably won't give me any trouble. And after we shrink tube it, you won't even know what happened here once it's installed and everything. I did order the correct size ring terminals just in case this does give me an issue. On the gauge side, I had the opposite problem. The only ring terminals I have to suit it are too small for the wire entirely. So just opened it up. The wire kind of tucks in there. Now if I fidget with it a little bit, I should be able to get it started on there. And if I can actually get it to close up so the ends meet, I can use the regular crimper. It's close. You can see the ends are not quite wanting to meet. We'll do a little more for it. No, oh, no. I just made it way worse. All right, so everything I'm doing to it is just making it worse. So I'm just going to solder that and call it good. And that is what just happened. Not going to be any connection troubles there, despite it being ugly. And now it's not really even ugly anymore. Other side, you can see I got into it a little too much with the torch and discolored it, but... It'll be all right. I also did cut this extra long, so if it does, it shouldn't be a big issue to shorten it up and put the proper ring terminals on it, which will be here tomorrow, but they're, you know, Amazon one day shipping tomorrow is probably three days from now, and this thing needs to be mowing later on. So this is what we're gonna do for now. It'll probably last, honestly, the rest of the life of the tractor, but next time I get back in here, we'll probably clean it up and make it right. So I just went ahead and finished up everything up here around the starter solenoid and got everything routed where it's going to route because the more I got into things, the more the updates were just gonna be like Groundhog Day if I just continue to make each and every step all the way through. And it would have been, I don't have quite the right materials and these wires are too freaking big. 
which is stuff you guys already knew, so I didn't feel the need to drag you along. Items of note, if you would want to do something like this, these are 5 sixteenths. Everything else on the tractor is like quarter inch or smaller, uh, so including the battery. So FYI, on mine, I only bought quarter inch lugs because I knew I could just drill them out, and that's what I did here. You will see the routing is not quite what it was originally. I decided to bring the battery cable from the rear on up and around uh, just because I was way out of room. It's a little difficult to show, but down at the bottom, I just couldn't get them tucked in as neatly as you know those six gauge wires were because they're massive wires. No big surprise. But otherwise, coming all the way back, we ended up doing more or less just fine. And then all of our excess is just dumped out the back. Once I get the fenders back on it, then I'll cut the positive to length and put the ring terminal on it and all that stuff. The only things we've got going on here that are a little sketchy, my split loom isn't big enough. This is what I had. It's half inch. I should have some three quarter for this size, but I've got it so it's doing the job I want it to do. Down there, the power wire is actually kind of, I won't say pinned against the hydraulic cylinder, but it's, it's tight against it. The good news about that is my cylinder has an internal bypass or my control valve does, so I don't use it anyway, except sparingly. So if I pick the deck up, it'll almost immediately drop, like within 30 seconds, it'll fall back down. So that's pretty much a static link. When I get to servicing it at some point, what I'll end up doing is just putting shims in behind it because it's got enough space that it can come over another quarter inch. So I'll just shim it on each side and move it over. And the hoses have got you know plenty of flexibility to do that, of course. Uh, these are also aftermarket hoses I just had made up at a hydraulic shop, so nothing special there. I did also repair the wiring here that we discussed. And I routed it a little differently too, just to come in behind the coil, just because I thought that was a little cleaner and it just sort of keeps it out of the way. Shouldn't be a big deal there. So now I think the next big move is gonna be to get the fenders back on it. But before I do that, I'm gonna take my grinder with a wire wheel and at least clean up this area and put some dielectric grease on it. I'll probably put some regular grease just on the other spots that are rusted. This one's getting dielectric though, because that's where the ground cable from the battery is gonna connect. It connects in this bolt hole. So I wanna make sure it's gonna get good contact through the fenders, through the frame and all that other good stuff. And that's what happened. Got it all cleaned up. Little rust spots, put some grease on them. Did the same thing on the fenders. So we should have a nice clean patch on the fenders for that to ground to. Now there's not much left to it, but to do it. The only real trick here is to, you know, get it under the brake pedal. And a little fidgety over on the lift side. There you go. So on that side, it's a little bit fidgety because you have to get around that lift arm that pops out right there. Otherwise, not a real big deal. The next problem we're going to have is getting all the holes lined up because they want to wobble bobble all over the place. Found the move for that is to, you know, get one or two started here and there. You should be able to get probably half of them in and then just start going down through with screwdrivers and punches and everything else and just start pulling the fenders into shape where you need them to be. That can get moderately more frustrating with the treads involved because now you have three layers of things to line up. You've got your bolts, the treads, the fenders. Speaking of treads, one thing I will say is that from the factory, those come with flathead screws in them and they're a complete nightmare to get in and out. If you manage to get yours out without much trouble, do not put them back in. Just put regular hex head bolts in there. Uh, this one's had stainless bolts in it for like, I don't know, 25 years now, and it has been far and away the way to go. So I'm gonna wrestle with all that for a while and get them all bolted up. I'm also gonna put the seat back on. There are just those two seat hinges right there, and you just have to have one of them off to scooch the seat out. You know, and I just have this one loose from before, so I'll just pop that guy back on, get the seat back on it. And then, you know, the battery and all that kind of stuff, get our cables finished up, get our voltage regulator put back on. You know the deal. So the fenders are all bolted on. Got my wiring all pulled on through there. I got my voltage regulator all plumbed back up. So then I went rummaging through my hoard and came up with what I believe is some 10 gauge black, which is gonna work out really nice for my voltage regulator ground. We already got one ring terminal crimped, soldered, and shrink tubed on so I can install it on that bottom location. And this thing has a ground strap right there, so it has to go there. And then once I get it all fed out, I'll be able to cut the excess off and get it to length and get a ring terminal on it. Speaking of terminals, also notice the factory terminal that was here was all melted, so I cut it off and just put a regular steel quick disconnect on it, so much tighter connection. Voltage regulator is now in. 
Also took a minute to put the seat on. The voltage regulator, you definitely want to do the bottom screw first, which is the screw that our ground wire is on. It's a lot easier to deal with that way than the top one. And now we're down to like the battery in the thing and make up the ground and positive cable, get our guy cut to length and all that. So after an absurd amount of time, we're finally done. One thing I did not consider at all is the positive line comes up between the frame and the battery. So it's actually wedged the battery over I could not fit any more wire in this thing if I tried to. I shouldn't have to. This is already completely ridiculous. Other side notes, I recently invested in a C-Tech uh, like battery maintainer that does like desulfation and all that crap, like a, an intelligent battery charger. And it failed this battery the first time I put it on there. Disappointingly, I had to do like a recondition cycle over the winter on this battery and everything was fine. And then I had the C-Tech on it for an additional two days after the first time it failed and it says it's fine. However, as soon as I put a voltmeter on this thing, it says like 11 and a half volts. So this battery is probably junk. So at the end of all of this, if it doesn't crank very well, I still won't know if I fixed anything because I got a feeling this battery is going to be on the way out the door soon. Let's go ahead and touch the negative cable to the negative terminal and see if we get like big sparks or something, see if we screwed something up. I have not yet tried this. Nope. Dead to the world, that's good. I just turned the ignition switch to on just to see if we'll get a little spark as it charges up the coil or anything. Nah, not showing any draw at all. I turned the headlights on, I think. No sparks and no headlights. This is not promising so far. No sparks, no headlights again. It's like a three position headlight switch and I'm never sure which way is actually on. Let's try again. No sparks, no headlights. That's not good. Well, interestingly, no power draw on this thing no matter what I try and do. So I'm gonna put the cable on because we know it's at least not gonna start a fire since you know nothing is happening at all. And I'll see if it'll crank. I'm gonna be super, super pissed if this thing won't crank. Keep in mind, I don't want it to start. Well, we got noises. I'm gonna start with someone noise that's real pissed. Hey, okay, I do have headlights. This switch is just flaky. Okay, we're in business. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention too is I bought one of those little like battery temp minder things for the SeaTac. If you've never seen either one, this is a SeaTac. It's just uh, like battery buddy or battery tender. On the end, you can swap out what you have on the end. Like right now, I got elevator clips and unplug them. I can plug in a hardwired attachment, except these are smart. So this has lights on it that flash and tell you the condition of whatever your battery is. So you can just look at it and see if it has a problem. And when I did this earlier, it immediately indicated a problem. I don't know if you'll see that flashing red LED or not. But that's after being on the charger for like three days. So yeah, this battery's probably torched. Incidentally, that's why I didn't bother to wire that thing in, because I figure in the next week or two, I will have to get a new battery. For reference, this is the behavior with a good battery. See it flashing green? So right now, just see what our current voltage is. 11.8, that's not great for a battery that just came off the charger. See what happens when I go to crank. Oh, it actually started turning over there for a second. Oh, that's bad. Alrighty, so I just took a quick minute to take a look at what you could see that I couldn't, and holy crap, the thing dropped down to like 4 volts, 3 point something. So yeah, that battery's junk. However, it's probably going to be good enough to get it to start to mow the grass at least once, which we really, really badly need to do. I'm like uh, probably two weeks late to the party. But I'm reasonably sure at this point that it's not going to burn the garage down, and since it cranked and the headlights work and that kind of stuff, that we probably didn't screw up anything too terribly badly with the wiring. So I'm going to go ahead and put the gas tank, tower assembly, whatever, back on it and get ready to jump start it to mow the grass, basically. Well, I finally hit something I can't work around and still get the result that I would have liked, but I can work around it all the same. Got my tower back on, gas tank back on, all that good stuff with five volts. This guy down here, you can see the wire is directly under there. And the screw that goes in there from the factory is like a self-tapper. So if I were to install that, there would be a problem. And right about there is as far as I can go without feeling resistance. So not even close. What's interesting is this is, you know, where the six gauge wire was. 
And this is way long enough to have been poking it too. I don't know. I have no idea why there wouldn't have been a problem from the factory with that, but whatever. Today we are just not gonna put one in there. If this ends up becoming a problem, I could see like um, maybe welding an addition on and getting back over here and getting a fastener in. The, the cable's still under there, but it's way far lower. Or even, you know, a little bit of an attachment right here and sink that self-tapper here. Anything but where it is. So I just barely managed to get this thing started up with my jump box. So then the following day I went on down to Wally World and got a new Never Start. This one being at a 340 cold cranking amp variety. I noticed my old one was 275. I don't think that's what my problem was, but more is always better. I do remember when I bought my old one, it was literally the only one they had on the shelf, so it was what it was. We got more now. This is the biggest one I was able to find. It was also almost $50, which is just Lay your hair right on back, but at least it is the current month that says 522. It is presently 522. So they don't get much newer than that. I got like five good years out of my last Never Start. So if this one does even half as well, which is usually what they do, they usually only make it a couple of years. I think we'll be doing well. Let's get the thing in there and we'll see what happens. Choke about half throttle. See what we get. Nothing. It's interesting. Oh, is the starter spinning the belt? Yep. Oh, there ain't no belt. Guess that guy's chilling out in the yard somewhere. Fortunately, I did just order a spare like a week ago. So, should be able to get it back in business here in a second. New belt installed. Let's try this again. So I never thought I'd be a connoisseur of boutique split loom sizes, but here we are. As it turns out, 9 16 is the perfect size for two gauge wire. Give you a little panoramic there. Fits really nice. <laughs> 9 16 is special order everywhere. This came from eBay. And you can see it's, you know, li not literally perfect, but as close as it's ever going to be. Anyway, so that's all taken care of, and I'm pretty happy with the result. So it is only long past when I made the commitment to go ahead and throw all this wire in, but it occurred to me that, hey, maybe we just have an engine grounding problem. So for testing, temporarily, testing temporarily. I have just ghettoed up this wire up to this bolt which goes straight into the starter generator and then on back to an existing chassis bolt. So this is not an ideal ground but it already has some amount of ground anyway. If it looks like after a couple weeks this is helping then I need to figure out what's going on with the motor. Maybe, maybe the thing like is missing half its bolts. I don't know. Just something to think about. Well, I just took it out and mowed with it and I started it up a couple times to see how it behaved. And I think that is an improvement. So might have something going on with the ground circuit on this thing. I won't really know until it basically winter time when the temperature gets real cold and the oil thickens up. And then we'll see if it cranks like it should or if it cranks like a bag of crap. So I think my temporary fix is gonna probably be with us for the summer and I'll find out in six months if this worked or not. But for now, that's gonna wrap this one on up. Appreciate you guys stopping in for it. We will catch you on the next one. I'm Max, that's Saddington Bear, and we make videos like this all the time. Here are a couple links to some other videos we've made, and we really appreciate you guys stopping in.